Great, thank you. Perfectly on time. <laughs> good start. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Anna Klein. I'm a partner in the commercial property team and head of ESG at Maples Teasdale. Thank you all for joining us for this, our second annual ESG webinar and the first in the current series of two events. I'm delighted to be joined by our panellists today, Laura Brill, Head of Responsibility and ESG at Orchard Street Investment Management, Gabriele Magotti, MD and Head of Asset Management at HID Realty Partners in Europe, and Aaron Taggart, Head of UK Real Estate Investment at Cheney Capital. With ESG becoming, rapidly becoming established as a mainstream topic in the real estate industry, and all the signs pointing to this becoming even more important in the future, most responsible businesses now have ESG firmly embedded in their decision-making processes. Whilst appetites and drivers may vary, ESG is clearly here to stay. Our objective during the next hour is to explore a couple of questions that are of key importance, but are less frequently discussed. Firstly, how is all of this funded? And second, how do you get buy-in from stakeholders such as occupiers, investors, investment committees and funders? During our panel discussion, we'll be addressing these questions and others and hope to provide valuable insights and practical ideas. Following the discussion, there'll be a Q&A session hosted by Rohan Campbell, a partner in our real estate finance team. Please do put your questions in the chat section during our discussion and afterwards so that Rohan can pick these up with our speakers later on. So without further ado, on to our first question, which I'd like to address to all of our speakers, but I might go to Aaron first if that's okay. Uh, how significant a factor is ESG to your business activities and decision-making processes? Sure, um, thanks Anastasia and good morning everyone. Um, I guess I'll, I'll answer that with um, about the journey that we've been on. I would say that this started to become embedded at Cheney probably about three years ago. Uh, what did it look like then? What does it look like now? Um, three years ago, it probably looked like a couple of paragraphs in an investment committee paper. Um, and I'd characterize it as a, as a, as a bunch of words. Uh, and what does it look like now? Um, it is really close to the top of our considerations when we're looking at an investment and that's changed hugely even in the last 12, 18 months. Um, why, why is that? I think that there are probably three main reasons. One is, um, and, and, and something that's dear to my heart, is the morality of it. Um, I just love the, the uh, being able to do something good with your capital. And I think this is something that, it, again, is going to, Come, further, come higher and higher in the agenda as time goes on. So I love that about this part of um, investing in real estate, the morality and the ethics of it. Um, I don't know what anyone else feels, but I'm a bit fed up with unethical examples of investing. Um, uh, also because our investors are asking us more and more. I mean, the, the question, the level of questions and uh, intrusion we get from investors asking about how deeply embedded is our ESG policy is changed enormously over the last couple of years, um, which is great. You know, I love that crossover between morality and capital. Um, and I think also, which is becoming more and more apparent is um, how, how much of an impact it's gonna have on risk. Um, we are just at the start of that journey of understanding impact on values uh, and that if you're not embracing it already, I advise you all to embrace it really quickly because it is going to have a, a you know, a relatively profound impact on values and risk in your portfolio if you're not looking in, into it. I think those are probably an idea of the journey we've been on over the last few years and how important and embedded it really has, has become. And, and thanks, thanks, Aaron. And, and Gabriella, is that similar to your experiences uh, at, at HIG? Yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, it is actually very similar. Um, uh, you know, when, when I joined HIG seven years ago, uh, ESG was not really a part of our decision-making process, I have to say. Uh, this has changed uh, uh, dramatically over the last two, three years. 
and is now a key element in our in the way we take decisions. Um, we have set up an ESG committee that discusses the, the key initiatives uh, throughout our platform, uh, from green measures to social justice, to the way we treat uh, the people in our portfolio companies. Uh, and every time we present a, a new deal to our investment committee, uh, one of the first questions that, that we get uh, is about ESG. Uh, our senior management is challenging us to demonstrate that we have thought about the investment in a sustainable way. Um, and the same happens with our investors. Uh, we have a very diverse base of uh, investors uh, across the globe. But I can say that, uh, you know, the focus on ESG is, uh, you know, uh, across the globe and universal. So, um, uh, you know, right now you can have the best track record uh, in the industry, but if you cannot demonstrate that you are able to make sustainable investments, you're not going to get the, uh, the commitments from, from the investors, as simple as that. So there has been a, a dramatic shift, but as Aaron was, say, what was saying, it is a journey. So I expect, you know, further developments in the next uh, uh, few years um, because the journey is not over. Thank you. And, and in, before we move on to Laura, just, just briefly, Gabriele, is that a common theme across Europe or is, how is Europe dealing with ESG? Yeah. Uh, well, obviously, uh, you know, there are markets that are more advanced. Um, uh, and I, I have to say that uh, the Nordics have been at the forefront uh, of uh, ESG uh, for quite a while, but, but also the UK and, and South, Southern Europe has been lagging behind, uh, especially in terms of uh, supply of, of uh, ESG um, products, uh, but the, the gap is is uh, is getting smaller and smaller over time. Yeah, uh, and over to you, Laura. Um, I think the key points have really been picked up on um, the massive um, change of pace. So um, prior to my current role at Orchard Street, I worked as a sustainability consultant for property companies across Europe for ten years, and the breadth of companies that are now taking this incredibly seriously and the um, how far the leaders who have been leaders for a long time are going on sustainability is just dramatically different than it was three years ago or even 12 months ago. Um, and speaking from the Orchard Street perspective, um, you know, we've been on the journey for 10 years, um, but, you know, there's a real, real change of pace about three years ago. Um, and because of the size of the business that we are in, so we have a 30 person business, a single investment committee, the, the seriousness with which we are able to consider every single investment decision from an ESG perspective um, is really dramatic because you only have to change, you only have to change how we're dealing with a few, you only have to change how the investment committee members are thinking among a few people. Um, and so you, and then you can have dramatic change across the portfolio. Um, and similarly, I think um, the interest of our investors has dramatically increased. Although there is a disconnect some, with some investors in terms of understanding how to apply sustainability and ESG to real estate as compared to their equity holdings. Um, and that's something that's you know, an ongoing topic of conversation and engagement with our investors. Um, I think because we, we operate mostly on behalf of pension funds. So in addition to the ethical side in terms of you know, trying to deliver a world that we all want to live in in the future, there's also a real fiduciary responsibility for us that we are investing on behalf of people who are relying on us to provide returns for them in their retirement. And so we need to take a long-term view, but also balance that against um, some of our funds being open-ended. So trying to, to manage that tension is is an interesting one, particularly when some of the interventions that you want to take in terms of um, you know, moving along with the net zero carbon strategy and some of the social value pieces, um, that really plays to having properties where you can go in and do retrofits and make changes and do regeneration. But a lot of these funds have been built around long income 
And so you don't necessarily have vacant possession. Um, so th there's there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity for creativity um, and for serious people to think about how we play to all of those interests. Um, and then I think the change in how we think about risk, I think that's where that plays in because it's not, if you're holding a building that you have out sold out on a long lease and you might not get back for 40 years, you've got income, but what is the value, what's happening to the value of that building over the 40 year period if you can't actually get in and make the changes you need to make in order to make it a saleable asset. Um, so understanding and thinking about risk is all at play, all shifting, and we're all trying to get used to this new normal. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to our next question, which ties in really with the first. Uh, I'm going to stress this uh, initially to uh, Aaron and Gabriele, and then a slightly different version of it uh, to you, Laura, because of your position being slightly different. Um, people talk about capital driving the ESG agenda. Uh, what impact on capital costs do you think ESG could eventually drive? Um, okay, I'll, I'll pick it up first. Um, I think I think it's been clear that there'll be a divergence in cost of capital, and you're already starting to see. Uh, uh, what, I'll, what, I'll, what I'll do is I'll give you an idea of what I'm seeing in the market, and then I'll relay it also onto what we're doing. So, in terms of the market at the moment, you're, you're already seeing lenders. Um, so there's o over and covert. Um, on the overt side, you're already seeing lenders um, coming up with green products. And ESG related products and that should attract um, a, a cheaper cost of capital so there should be the good going back to one of the points that Laura made in terms of in terms of cost look you know a lot of the time this does cost more mm. all right let's not get shy away from that fact it really does um, however there's two things that play into that and I'll go back to the original question I promise um, firstly um, I think that capital help offset some of this cost. Okay? And, I, and I use capital broadly in terms of equity investor capital, um, because if you don't have a fully functioning ESG strategy, it's gonna, you're going to make it harder and harder to raise capital, but the right type of capital. Number one. Point number two, in terms of debt capital, again, on the overt side, if you've got an, um, uh, a, a, let's call it a qualifying, um, ESG strategy and development or investment, then you should be able to attract on the covert side. On the covert side, uh, to get a bank's attention at the moment, um, if you do have an ESG leaning strategy, they love that at the moment and they will answer your call and they'll answer your email. If you're ignoring it and it's not in the first few lines of your proposition, they may not get back to you. So that's that's more the overt side of things, you know, really um, getting somebody's attention. If you, if you do not now have um, commentary and a strategy around DSG, you may not get some love from the banks. So that's what definitely what I'm starting to see. Uh, and, and it's only going one way. Um, what are we trying to do? What we're trying to do is use our capital to shift the debate. So I guess move from the position of um, actions rather than words. So we're trying to come up with a framework that measures what, how, uh, how the investment or development fits into our, our ESG requirements. And what I want that to do, I want it to be tensioned enough that some investments fall outside our criteria. And we can then use what we see across the market to also help shift the debate, to say to a client, look, you're a little bit outside our trend lines, but we want you to come back in. And if you did these three things, um, or, or even just measured it, some of it's already been done, just not capturing what they're doing. <laughs> Um, because we're all on this journey of education. If you can do that, then you fall inside our tram lines. Um, and that's what I want. I want us to use our money because ultimately, especially if we're lending, if we're, if we're equity, we can absolutely have a, we're, we're the decision makers. 
Um, but if we're there, we're ultimately not decision makers. But if we can use our money and capital to influence, then I think that's a great win. It's a very, very positive approach. And it's interesting to hear that people are coming to you and you'll be able to guide them to take a few extra steps to, to satisfy the criteria, the investment criteria, because I think that that is something that people sometimes struggle with knowing how, how much information they need to provide and how to do that, how to bring it all together. So to have that guidance from your side, I think would be very useful. Thanks. Um, Gabriella, is there anything you wanted to comment on that? Yeah, but basically, you know, Aaron said, 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 said it all, but, uh, you know, the, the, my view is that the, the ESG is likely to, to drive uh, capital costs downwards over the long term, because if you look at the deal uh, from uh, a risk perspective, uh, you know, by uh, addressing all the, uh, uh, you know, risks uh, from environmental, uh, uh, social, and corporate standpoint, uh, you are delivering uh, better risk-adjusted returns to your investors at the end of the day. Um, so it's not only about the returns, uh, you know, there is evidence that, uh, you know, ESG uh, compliant investments are delivering uh, superior uh, returns, uh, uh, but I, it's, it is also about the, the risks on the deal and you know uh, the environmental risks and their social risks are probably the biggest risks uh, out there in the market at the moment so uh, by uh, structuring the deal in a sustainable way you are actually mitigating uh, some of the risks uh, and you are uh, you know delivering uh, better risk adjusted returns to your investors so I can see that um, as uh, a way to uh, drive your uh, debt costs uh, downwards. Uh, and as Aaron was saying, there is already availability in the market of you know, green loans uh, and, and also equity costs. Uh, you know, over the long term, uh, um, uh, ESG uh, compliant funds uh, will be able to attract uh, investors at a lower cost of capital uh, compared to uh, non-compliant uh, um, uh, managers. Um, so th that's where the market is, is moving at the moment. Uh, and on the debt side, uh, I haven't seen yet any, uh, different, any difference in pricing between uh, uh, retrofitting and, and new developments which is kind of, um, you know, curious, uh, but I expect a, a you know, a, a difference in, in the way uh, people are pricing uh, uh, retrofitting uh, to take place in the future. Um, you know, uh, new developments, especially greenfield developments, uh, cannot be considered, uh, you know, uh, environmentally sustainable uh, unless, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you do them with a completely different approach to construction management, which I haven't seen yet uh, in the market or, or, or in uh, only in very limited cases. Um, so th that's probably uh, something that will, uh, will happen in the market in, in the next uh, uh, few years. Thank you, Gabrielli. Now, um, Laura, your, your position is slightly different um, as an unleveraged fund. Um, how do you fund your ESG activities um, and how challenging is it to get your investment committee to buy into them? Oh, sure. I just want to say that's such an interesting observation, Gabrielli. I've, I've made a note there about future capital preferential pricing for, uh, for retrofits. <laughs> um, but so, so yeah, as you mentioned, um, the majority of the three and a half billion that we run is unleveraged. Um, there, there are a few properties with leveraging in, in, uh, in one of our mandates. Um, and so we have sort of three pots of money that we can go to. Um, one is service charge. So, and, and there are specific um, improvements that can be run through a service charge. So for example, you know, an upgrade of LED lighting um, can potentially be run through service charge. Um, putting in smart meters can potentially be run through a service charge. Um, so there are upgrades that could go through that way. 
Um, and then the sort of the deeper upgrades that are actually fall under refurbishment. So those go through capital costs um, and those um, have to be run via a business case as in terms of, you know, what can we expect in, ter uh, in terms of the value that's generated either in terms of getting a better rent, um, higher leasing velocity or improvement to the capital value of the project. Um, and then the final thing is actually um, fund costs. So there are, and, and, and whether or not um, the project under review is, is important enough to risk management um, and to doing at a particular, you know, earlier rather than later that we actually run it as a, as a fund cost um, that's borne by the landlord. Um, so those are the three pots that we go to. Um, and it's, uh, it, it will depend. I mean, I think um, our investment committee is pretty clued up. We've been monitoring the costs um, and uh, that are associated with things like, you know, changing the roof, putting the solar PV on, moving to electrification. Um, and then what kind of returns we're seeing on that, what kind of interest we're seeing from the market. Um, and it, it, uh, there's also the question though that you can't overload, you can't overload the fund with costs because then it's not going to give the returns that the people who are invested in that fund have every right to expect. So it's balancing those three. And, and in your experience, um, just circling back to a bit of what Gabriella was talking about on the retrofitting, um, I should open it up to uh, Laura and Aaron as well, but in your experience, is, it, is there a difference between securing buy-in or funding, or however that comes, whether it's internal funding or external, in terms of, is there, is there a difference between get, uh, the availability of, of funding for uh, retrofitting rather than new developments, or are they generally treated the same at the moment? So we do not do new development. Um, it's a very rare case where we would do a knockdown and start from scratch. Um, and the, the vast majority of our work is refurbishment. So we sort of, we, we fit in that box that Gabriella was, um, was mentioning. Um, and that's why I was particularly interested in this point. <laughs> I, think, I think from, from my side, I'm gonna go slightly different tangent in relation to that question. In, in, I'm, I'm also gonna stray into an area that I don't really have the level of expertise on, but I'm gonna reply in anyway. So in regards to in regards to refurb, the I think I think there should be um, a more advantageous tax regime linked to refurb and retrofit. You know, it shouldn't be that you get the AT back on a new build and you don't and you're improving the existing building. That just makes no sense to me. Certainly in regards to a ESG related agenda. So. I don't know who, you know, I'm going to see whether I can investigate that a bit more and use our influence to try and drive that debate. But, you know, it's entirely right that we should be putting our, putting more energies into, um, into, do, into, into improving existing buildings rather than throw a new load of resource into a new development. Um, if it can be done cost effectively and, the right ESG st standards. No, I, 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 the way it is at the moment doesn't seem to make any sense. Fair enough. All agree there. <laughs> um, so, just moving on then, talking more about um, occupiers. Uh, we're increasingly hearing about occupiers who won't take space in buildings with poor sustainability credentials. Does that reflect your experiences? And is the picture the same across all sectors of the industry? Um, who would like to, should we go with Gabriele maybe first? Yeah, I can take that. Uh, it's actually a very good question. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I have to say that uh, for the office segment, uh, tenants are making pressure on the landlord, on the landlords throughout the uh, continental Europe and the UK to improve uh, offices. Uh, and, and from an environmental standpoint, and make an effort to uh, you know uh, improve uh, the, the standards, and uh, this is you know uh, quite common um, uh, you know uh, in, in all the markets, uh, and you know you have tenants uh, that are not actually. Uh, taking possession uh, unless you comply with very strict uh, uh, requirements in terms of e ESG. Uh, 
Um, and you can see that in the take up in the markets, uh, you know, even uh, before COVID, but probably uh, even uh, after COVID, uh, you know, the, the, the green buildings are leased up uh, quicker and at better terms um, compared to, to, to the others. So simply because the, the demand is higher and the tenants realize that having a green building is, is good for their reputation, but it's also good for their p &L. Um, um, So we may have a different view on uh, what the offices will look like in a post-COVID environment, uh, but I think we all agree that the, 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 the new offices will be green uh, or as green as they get now. Um, I, I can say that it is not the same across all the sectors. Uh, for example, in the hotel segments, uh, I haven't seen uh, uh, tenants with few exceptions being focused on the ESG credentials. Um, uh, unless, you know, there are elements that have a direct impact on their p &L. Uh, like energy savings, for example. Um, and, and this is something that has to change uh, if we want to meet our uh, objectives, uh, uh, you know, of, of zero carbon, because hotels have a significant environmental impact. Um, so, uh, um, you know, uh, probably the awareness is, is more uh, uh, at the corporate level at the, at the moment and, uh, you know, for the office tenants than for the other asset classes. Um, so it will probably take a while before, uh, uh, you know, it spreads out to the other uh, asset classes. Aaron, is that, does that reflect your, your observations as well? Yes, um, I think I, I think I think certainly in terms of that. However, um, the 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 view that I'd also have is certainly in the residential sector. Also, don't forget that there is the S and the G. Uh, we do focus a lot on the E. Um, so, for example, we've got an impact fund, a chain of an equity fund. That, for example, we just. Um, a scheme in Manchester city centre, which is a build to rent. And uh, that that will volunt volunt voluntarily have 35% key worker housing in the, in there. And, and you know, uh, true key worker housing. So we're actually being scientific about what kind of rent levels we can set them. You know, we, we'll look at what their mean take home salary is and apply a metric that says, one third of their take home salary can be spent on our rent. So we're doing it properly. And it means, and getting back to a point that, you know, Laura quite rightly made is the complexity around the um, requirement for us to provide a good or as good a return as possible. And then you've got the impact side, which is, well, we're going to take a slightly lower rent across the building. Um, so you have that tension. It's not easy. However, um, we can demonstrate over a long term that maybe that impact side has a slightly sharper yield and we're getting valuers to buy into that because look, that should be really full all the time because it's a, it's a you know a decent discount for the open market rents. Um so I think I think on the, the residential side, there is definitely a lot you can do on the social side of things and also governance as well. Um, if you don't have that right, then that's gonna you're gonna get dinged on that eventually. So make sure you focus on the government side. Uh, the other the other part of the market, I, I I sit on a I've got a slightly biased view on hotels because I sit on the GRA Global Sustainability Hospitality Forum. And I see the amount of effort they're putting in, and the amount of uh, buy-in that they have from hoteliers and big groups around the globe. You know. The, they are definitely shifting a gear, undoubtedly. So I think it's definitely starting to happen and um, they're getting better at capturing the changes they're making, which is great. Um, so I think, look, if you're, if you're going to be a lead on this and you're going to capture that and you're going to, you know, it will be a point of difference in the future. 
So I'm glad that these guys are leaning into the, the issue. And then lastly, on the things like student, for example, you know, there's nothing like the young to be aware of ESG criteria. Uh, if I look at just map it across to my children's uh, focusing on ESG and making sure that Daddy takes his reusable cup in every day and stuff like that. Um, you know, the, I think I think again on the student accommodation side, if you can demonstrate all three elements very well. Um, and you're looking after your students, and that, that was going to be another thing I was going to come on to, which is it's all about the experience as well of your end user, whether it's hotels, office, residential, um, you know, to use your capital good and um, making sure that whoever your end user is get, gets a better experience and you're thinking about them be a bit more can only be positive. So it gives you a bit of a and up on what Thank you. And um, Laura, when we spoke, you had some very interesting views on the, on the retail sector as well. I wonder if you would mind sharing them. Sure. I'll also touch briefly on industrial. And I might start there if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. Um, just because we haven't talked about it particularly. So um, we, are, we have actually seen some pretty positive response in the industrial sector to improvements um, yeah, on an ESG perspective. We just finished a carbon neutral um, set of industrial sheds in Hounslow, which are A plus um, EPCs, which means they generate more solar um, power than is used on site for the base building. Um, and we've had really strong success with that in terms of occupiers specifically choosing the buildings because of the ESG credentials in addition to the location and the specifications. Um, and so that's interesting to see. And they're not um, sort of Amazon or sort of the huge names that we all talk about in terms of warehousing. These are more SME type, um, but they're they're value driven. They're looking for something that fits their own um, their own values from a corporate perspective, and they have the flexibility to choose the space they want. And they've chosen to go to a carbon neutral industrial location that also has um, some well being aspects to it with fruit trees and nice views and um, soundproofing, thermal cooling, um, and uh, you know. EV charging for bicycles, that kind of, sorry, EB charging for bicycles. <laughs> so it is possible to have these sort of nice little social perks in an industrial um, asset as well. And the other thing to remember is that, you know, whilst, um, you know, housing and shopping centers have very clear social value, these other sectors also provide important employment opportunities. And so I'm um, thinking about the, what the asset provides in the round um, not just sort of the ESG initiatives that you do on the asset, but sort of what businesses go in there and what kind of jobs they offer is really important. Um, so on the retail side, we have actually seen a real mix. So we're seeing some retailers um, who are driven by their own agendas. And I think Gabrielli mentioned, you know, that, that there can be a really strong corporate agenda. And it's a matter of getting that to trickle down to the real estate um, function within a business. Um, and so We'll sometimes see retailers sort of picking and choosing, i.e., well, this particular green lease clause aligns to our target, so we'll sign that one, but we don't want these ones. Um, sometimes we're seeing, um, you know, actually uh, the, the, the legal team that they've hired are the ones who are pushing back, but that isn't actually mirrored within the retailer itself. And so if you can, if you can, if you can keep carrying on the conversation, and take it past the sort of the the, um, the gates of the legal team, you can get somewhere. Um, and that that's a real mind shift. Cause I think for a long time, there's been a sort of, oh, this is this stuff is stuff that we can cut out in negotiation. It's part of the, the horse trading that's gonna happen. And that you, in, in, order to, in order to change those minds and to change that way of negotiating leases, the investment manager, or in fact, the retailer, if that's if they're the ones who are driving, have to say, "Oh no, this is not negotiable. Let's let's negotiate something else." <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, just yeah. To, we're definitely seeing that now. Um, in three or four years ago, maybe green clauses were nice to have, but a number of our clients now are they, you know, we have to take specific instructions to take things, you know, to agree to take green clauses out. And I think it is that is changing definitely, um, which is good news. <laughs> Sorry to let you carry on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. And then, you know, so I think the, um, and then from a social side, there is, you do have, there, there, this is a gray area, but are there tenants who run so contrary to the principles of your investors that you, 
can you can you agree can you agree leads with them and i think that's an open conversation i mean i'm i'm i'd actually be interested if that's something aaron that you're coming across in your impact fund or gabrielle that that, that you're considering as you're um, considering opportunities because that's another that's expanding the remit of the real estate investment manager very far and it's definitely it's it's a I think that's an area that we're going to see people grappling with more as inevitably in sustainability and real estate that the trends shift, right? So net zero carbon is center, center stage right now and will hopefully continue to be very, very central. But within two years, we're going to have something else that has become the thing we're all trying to do. And it's possible this will be it, possibly, you know, the the, the, the social impact of of the sort of the third, the scope three of your supply chain, who are you renting to in real estate? Yeah, I think I think the real world example um, is fantastic, um, and it's great to see real world examples rather than us just talking a load of words. Um, but I think I think the point made is is great that um, we're all on this journey of of education. You know, we all started somewhere. We all probably rolled our eyes at the start um, and we're not doing it anymore. Uh, and, and I guess that's probably, you know, one of the, one of the key messages to the, to the wider audience is, is one that um, whatever we put in place now will change. Uh, the way we're approaching it now will change. You know, the, what I'm saying to my investment committee is I'm getting everyone all our stakeholders to buy into our changing framework is whatever I put in place now will change. You know, will not stay still. It will not be static. It will evolve and improve. Um, and the focus, as Laura says, may change somewhere else or slightly lean in a different direction. Um, but also just our own personal education. No, nobody is an expert here. Yeah, we've all we're all at different parts on the curve. But how exciting is it to be on the start? Of a journey of something that's going to be so profound uh, and so you know hop on board because you can really help make a difference and 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 bring yourself up to speed really quickly because um there is a lot of material we are getting better at understanding our impact um and so look i, I think i think the the message is that um all areas of ESG are, uh, are just as important. Yeah, we are focusing a lot on the E, and that is great because that is probably the ex existential threat that we face at the moment. So it's right that we put a lot of our, pardon the pun, energy into that. Um, but as time goes on, you should think about all aspects and going back to the social and the impact that you have on people's lives and all working environment is you know, it, it is a big bonus. You know, if you get those testimonials, you speak to those people who are living and breathing your buildings and your developments and your investments. Um, I think that's the way that capital is is moving towards. And again, I think that's just as profound as the, is limiting our environmental impact. Thank you. Um, just a reminder to people in the audience, please feel free to put questions in the chat box for um, Rohan to pick up in, in a little while. Uh, but yeah, leading on from what we've just been discussing, so you put all these things in place. How, how do you measure the uh, value or the success of ESG activities? Is, is there an easy way to do that? <laughs> Ask Laura. <laughs> And mute. Ah, it's such a good question because what does success mean? <laughs> There's such a wide array of different ways to measure it um, from external benchmarks um, such as and uh, so UNPRI, um, Gresby, um, there's a lot of net zero carbon um, benchmarks at the moment, um, World Green Building Council, UK Green Building Council, um, uh, there's TCFD, but in terms of Part of the problem with measuring the value of ESG activities is always that unless you are really far out on the innovative edge, good ESG management is good real estate management and trying to pull those two apart and say, well, this is just because we did these extra little bits 
is very difficult because it's all to do with the stock selection and you know thinking about what the local market wants and positioning it well in response to that, which is how you've chosen your ESG initiatives. So that's always the tricky bit. Um, putting that aside though, I think there's been a, um, how we try to do it internally um, is that we, you know, every, every project that goes through our investment committee has a, you know, a pro forma um, and it talks about the, you know, how has ESG been considered? What are the extra costs associated with it? Is it aligning with our minimum standards? Um, and then at the end of it, we do a debrief. And so I work with the asset managers um, in terms of um, a little summary of the context, what it is that they did on this project that was different than what they would have done, you know, otherwise, what the additional costs were, and then if there were any benefits that came out of that, that um, whether that be that they rented up six months ahead of time, um, ahead of the forecast, that um, they had occupiers who chose the space above other spaces because of ESG, because there's an additional revenue stream that's been created um, from solar, if the capital value has been increased because there's some sort of annualized rentable income. Um, so that's how we're trying to look at it. Um, I think going forwards, we, we are going to be considering how we can do a sort of um, more of a valuations perspective um, and, you know, pull this space. Maybe next year we can talk more about that. It certainly sounds like we're progressing that way. And I think there's a real appetite for it, isn't there? So, yeah. Uh, Gabriele, is there anything you'd like to add on that? Uh, yeah, no. Well, we have quite a different way in, in, in the way we measure uh, our initiatives uh, in the sense that for the environmental part, we have quite a, a you know, scientific approach uh, to it. We, we tend to uh, measure our carbon, carbon footprint uh, throughout the life cycle of the asset from the construction, so where the raw materials are sourced, uh, how they are shipped, uh, blah, blah, uh, throughout the operational use of the assets. So it's a very, uh, you know, uh, analytical way of measuring uh, the environmental impact of our assets. Uh, for the uh, S and G, it is uh, less scientific, let's say. So. Um, we have more of a, you know, practical approach to it. Uh, for example, we encourage our portfolio companies to have a more uh, diverse uh, board membership representation as well as a diverse uh, workforce. Uh, we have a number of initiatives to support the local communities. Uh, but we are lacking a, a um, you know, a, a measurable way to, uh, to, to, to track down our progress on, on, on this. And uh, we are working in that direction to make it more measurable. Um, but we are probably more advanced uh, on the environmental part, uh, which is probably easier to do, uh, I have to say. And, uh, you know, I agree that uh, things are going to change over time, but the focus on the carbon fo footprint is going to stay, it's not going to change. Uh, it is so important, it is such a, an overarching uh, team uh, that we will focus on that, you know, going forward for the next uh, uh, 20, 30 years. Um, so, uh, you know, we will continue improving the way we measure our environmental impact, but the carbon will be, uh, you know, at the core of the way we uh, measure our progress. Thank you. And does that, does that mirror your experiences as well, Aaron? Um, I've just un underlined the word complex, double underline. Um, because it is, it's, in, it is, it's incredibly complex, the answer to the question. Um, I, th I, th I feel that um, we're all at the start of the journey still, right? And so in terms of, in terms of measuring, um, a lot of it is going to be done in hindsight. And that when you're being a pioneer, you're, you're at the start of something, sometimes you just have to have a leap of faith. Um, and, but it will be demonstrable, I think, quite clearly soon the impact it will make. So for example, Laura's exam great example in um, on, on the on the industrial side, it'd be it'd be you, you know, you can never accurately track 
what it would have been like if they hadn't put the ESG principles in place in terms of letting velocity and rents. But it'd be interesting to track what it was like against business plan. And I'm sure that um, what the, you know, Laura and the guys at Orchard Street um, will do next time will, I'm sure they won't go back. They'll be going forward. Now, they won't look at it and say, ah, oh, wasn't as good as we thought it was going to be. Um, hopefully the message is that was great, a positive experience. Let's apply those principles again going forward or um, let's even improve on what we did. And that's why I hope, you know, I, I just hope the direction of travel is all in that direction. Um, some of the questions I can see coming through will we'll, we'll pull out some of these, some of these more, uh, com this more complexity, but it really is. It's not easy to measure not easy being a pioneer um but hey you regret it if you don't do it I like that <laughs> brilliant okay just so on my final question um just a very brief one really uh, before i hand over to rohan um briefly if you had to pick one area of esg to focus on for the next three years what would that be and, and why um gabriele can i ask you that one yeah i would probably pick uh, the logistics sector uh, which is a huge source of uh, carbon emissions, uh, given the way that the global supply chain is uh, wired in the global economy. Uh, uh, and if we want to reach our targets, uh, you know, it is critical that we start rethinking the, the way the, the, the global supply chain uh, it is structured. Uh, there are things that are obviously uh, we cannot control, but there are other aspects that, you know, where we can have an impact. For example, the, the way uh, to, to, to do last mile delivery or the way you do the click and collect, uh, um, uh, you know, in, in retail stores. Uh, and this starts from the real estate. So the entire real estate community should start thinking as, uh, you know, rewiring the, the, the supply chain and improve the way we ship goods uh, and we deliver them uh, and it's critically important. Thank you, I couldn't agree more. Um, uh, uh, Laura, what's, any, th any thoughts on that one? Sure. Um, so I think net zero carbon is going to remain hugely important over the next three years. Um, and I like it because it mobilizes a lot of other connect. It's a very interconnected piece of work. So um, it requires tenant engagement, which can then touch on other areas of ESG. Um, it inquire, requires you to look at um, biodiversity, requires you to look at renewables. Um, and it links really strongly to um, the other ESG area that um, I would pick to focus on, which is air quality. Um, and air quality has happily come I think up in the consciousness due to COVID, although of course COVID itself is um, a catastrophe, but I think it has made people so much more aware of the importance of, of air, of um, ventilation, and that it's an opportunity to really bring forward the, the other health impacts that air quality has. Um, it's absolutely lifelong from the time that you're a baby um, to the time that you're an adult. And actually, those are actually times when you're most vulnerable, it affects every single system in the body, body and it has a uh, you know, affects a number, um, 36,000 36, early deaths in the UK every year. Um, and because we spend 90% of our time indoors, the air quality that our buildings provide and how we operate our buildings to provide maximum air quality is one of the biggest areas of social impact that real estate um, developers and operators can have. Thank you. That's great. And um, last but not least, Aaron. <laughs> I had to follow that, to be honest. <laughs> Very <laughs> profound and uh, yeah, a really subject that's close to my heart as well, being a, on a, uh, a pro-cycling uh, group um, because of air quality and people less reliant on the cars. Um, I don't want to start that debate here, uh, but um, I, think, I think for us, we're going to definitely um, keep focusing on the social side. You know, it's a great it's a great part of the industry to be involved in um, changing people's lives you know, and, and and giving them access to real estate that they wouldn't be able to afford um, and and making sure that their experience is as good as anybody else's in the building is again something that's dear to my heart as well um, which I think again we can talk about 
about in regards to some of the questions that were that we'll go on to shortly. I'll, I'll save save a little bit of. Uh, Thank you. That's great. Uh, on that note, then, I'm. thank you very much for speaking with me, everyone. I really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. I'm going to hand you over to Rohan now just to go through some of the questions that we've been asked. Thank you. Thanks, Anna, and uh, good morning, all. Um, as Anna said, uh, I am a real estate finance partner here at Maples Teasdale. I'm going to take us through a short Q&A just to finish off uh, on some of the themes that we have been exploring today with the panel. Um, so I think, you know, uh, it's fair to say that um, we've talked a lot about uh, the journey as in where we are on it and where we're going next and also how funding can influence that. So I thought I would pick out a couple of questions, perhaps which look at more where we are now and then perhaps focus on what's going to happen next in a bit more detail. So I think um, first question, which I should perhaps direct Aaron, as he's mentioned in it, um, is to uh, talk a little bit more about how you would look at your investment considerations in the S uh, part of the ESG and particularly perhaps with a, a view to um, social or affordable housing and how you see that. Yeah, um, I think that's from Moshi, so thank you for the question. Um, how, do I, how do we think about it is we, we, you know, we going back to the point that I made earlier is how, how can we change people's lives um, and how do we do that demonstrably so and scientifically in terms of if, it's, if it is affordable housing requirements um how do we do it properly so uh, it, it's hard on the one dimensional question um but if Moshi wants to talk to me about it offline i'm happy to to have a have a proper interactive conversation but i'll try and address what i think he's talking about um the the way the way, way we approach social is i can tell you what we don't do all right, one is we don't fudge it. We're gonna do it, we're gonna do it properly. Um, and that means elements such as we will have um, tenure blind accommodation. But there'll be no difference between what our private tenants experience compared to our key workers or our social tenants experience. So um, I think that's, again, incredibly important to us. And, and, and one of, the, one of the, the, the main changes we've, we, we, you know, we wanted to bring to the sector um, as we invested. So that's definitely one thing we don't have port, what we used to call poor doors. You know, the different types of occupiers walking in different parts of the accommodation morally abhorrent to me. Um, and the other thing we don't do is that we don't, you know, everybody gets access to any amenities that we have on the building. Um, and look, maybe all of that does come at a bit of a cost. Um, but if you're a long-term investor into this sector, then it's a rounding error at the end. Yeah, it really is. And uh, for us, therefore, we've got ourselves and our investors comfortable that, okay, you may take a little bit less income for a period of time, but you'll get it back. Yeah, you'll get it back eventually. How do you get it back? It's not clearly demonstrable at the moment, but I'm telling you, you'll get it back. And it may be a sharper yield at, at exit. It may be that planning authorities help you out a bit more because you're doing it right. It may be, I don't know, on the student side, because again, we're putting voluntary affordable rents into our building um, where we are a joint venture partner, um, that the universities actually want to have a relationship with you and maybe give you a norms agreement I'm, I'm a great believer in what goes around comes around and therefore I'm willing to be a pioneer and our investors are willing to be pioneers because we do think it makes economic sense um, and it makes moral sense. So I'm not sure if that addresses Moshi's question, but I'm, you know, if he, if he wants to reach out to me afterwards and we can have a conversation about it, but hopefully that does. Thanks, Aaron. I think that's really helpful. Um, Laura, could I pass it on to you next if you want to say anything around that for us? Sure. Um, so social uh, a bit, housing is not a big part of our portfolio at mm -hmm. the moment. So it's developing. Um, this is not something I can speak to really from an Orchard Street perspective. Um, I have in a previous incarnation uh, worked in social housing development in the U.S. Um, and I, I mean, I echo a lot of what Aaron said in terms of ensuring that the design quality and the build quality are 
um, are high for the, so for the social housing um, because at the end of the day, you want it to be a cohesive community and you don't want it to feel like those people and these people and we're separate and we have our own separate courtyards. Um, so from an investment um, opportunity, I can't really speak to you. I can say from a, a very personal perspective that um, I chose to purchase a house in a co-housing development in Cambridge, which was purchase built. And I think that's a really interesting model um, that is community led design, self-owned and managed by the people who live in the co-housing community and actually designed quite differently. So you have smaller private spaces and larger shared spaces, which facilitates more of the community interactions that actually generate social value, generate connections with neighbors in terms of being able to take care of an elderly neighbor, in terms of taking care of someone who's just had a baby, in terms of you know someone falling and breaking their leg and somebody else being able to come over and make meals for them. The way that a lot of new housing developments are built separate us and the co-housing model is one, you know, fairly far down the spectrum example of how you can redesign housing so that it actually facilitates those social interactions and creates social capital. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Laura. It's very uh, interesting to hear the personal take on it too. Um, Gabriele, I wondered whether you know, you'd like to take that on and maybe give us a, some insight about the, you know, the S, but perhaps, you know, you talked a bit before about, you know, the, the, the corporate uh, occupy market and whether you know, that was something you had a view on in terms of how that's being developed there as well? Yeah, um, uh, actually I have to say that, uh, uh, you know, the, the corporate market uh, has, has made uh, significant progress uh, on, on the social uh, elements, uh, uh, but it is not really um, uh, up to the task yet. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I haven't seen uh, 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 an effort made to uh, cope with all the uh, social uh, justice issues uh, that we have uh, in, in the society. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it has taken more of a, uh, um, a reactive approach I have to say, when, when uh, there is a, a new challenge that is coming up, uh, the, the corporate uh, uh, market is, is reacting to it, uh, but is, it is not proactive and, and trying to address issues, um, you know, in a proactive way. So, um, uh, you know, when it comes to um, uh, the, the social and affordable housing, I tend to agree with uh, what Laura was saying. We, we are not really into that uh, market. We have not made investments in the, in the market yet, but generally speaking, the approach uh, that we have is, is uh, you know, uh, improving the, the, the quality of the facilities by, uh, you know, uh, 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 creating a, a new product in line with uh, uh, higher standards of living uh, so we, we buy something that is outdated, underinvested, and, and we invest significant uh, uh, capex to improve the facilities. Um, so that's the way that you 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 create a more uh, 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 you know uh, uh, amenable uh, space for living. Um, uh, but um, uh, you know, having said that. Uh, the, the social element is, is, is really something that, uh, you know, people will, will need to focus on in, in, in the next uh, years uh, as the challenges will, will continue to come. Okay, that, thank you, Gabriel. I think that's, that's, again, you know, really insightful and also interesting to hear about you know, the reactive nature and perhaps need for more proactivity. Um, and I think uh, that helps, you know, just uh, moving on to probably the last question for the session, um, just to take us... Uh, to look forward, uh, I guess, and that that really is, I think, the first one there on the list, which I think is an interesting one, uh, which is that obviously with more, uh, you know, um, focus on ESG and and the sort of um, the the, the um, increase, significant increase in ESG funds coming to market, um, do you think that um, that greater competition is going to lead to more of a streamlining of ESG targets uh, and KPIs in in real estate, or do you think that actually it may lead to a greater divergence as funds compete for uh, to, to attract capital and also to win 
um, deployment opportunities? Um, maybe if I just start with Gabriele this time. Uh, yeah, um, obviously, you know, there is competition in the market uh, and there are new SG funds coming up basically every day. Um, uh, the, the way I see is that there will probably be um, a, 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 a way for investor to uh, track performance uh, from an, an ESG standpoint that will be, uh, uh, you know, developed uh, and the, the KPIs will improve. Uh, right now, uh, you know, there is not consistency uh, across the market, um, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, new uh, KPIs are coming up. Um, and uh, this is probably uh, consolidates uh, in the next few years. Um, so um, I, I see uh, KPIs as a way for, uh, uh, you know, investors to differentiate uh, between uh, uh, different funds and uh, different um, uh, uh, GPs, different uh, managers. Um, you know, uh, there are funds uh, that, uh, you know, have the ESG um, principle at the core of the way they uh, approach investments. Uh, there are other funds uh, that have uh, the ESG principle uh, more uh, as a check the box uh, kind of approach. Uh, and, you know, by having standardized uh, KPIs uh, to track down uh, uh, your performance, uh, the investors will be able to differentiate between uh, the two categories. Um, so obviously the, the competition uh, um, will, uh, uh, will, will create uh, a selection in the market. Great, thank you for that. Uh um, then Laura, sorry, I just wanted to pass that to you because I know that you mentioned actually earlier uh, the different um, types of uh, you know, uh, goals or, or KPIs that are out there for different things. Um, so I wondered whether you had a view around that too. Um, yes, I could, I could talk about it from practical experience in terms of, um, right, try to come up from the rosy side. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> I think there will be a convergence in terms of some key metrics and KPIs that stay relatively constant in terms of carbon, energy, water, waste. I think those are relatively easy to define. Um, and there's a lot of work going on by benchmarks in the industry trying to align with each other. And you see that with them cross-referencing. Um, uh, for example, UMPR and Gresby cross-reference each other. Um, but you also see it in the well-being um, space. So well reset, aerated um, are all cross-referencing each other. BREEAM and LEAD are cross-referencing the well-being standards. So there's a ton of work happening in order to be able to um, align requirements so that it becomes easier to do, pro to do projects and report on them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there will be some core KPIs that will tend to be um, uh, aligned across, across funds. And that is an advantage in terms of investors being able to do some head-to-head -head comparisons. However, speaking from personal experience with setting up frameworks for new funds and looking, doing scans of, okay, we want to be aligning with this framework and that framework and this framework, that framework, and okay, so this one hits these three, da, 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 da. There will be things you want to do with your fund that are not well expressed by the KPIs that are in the market. And because if you're doing an ESG fund, you are trying to do something different. And I think that's the point of it, the, the, the point that comes in the question later on. So if you're trying to do something different that's not well measured by what's out there, then you are almost by definition going to have to have a KPI that is slightly tweaked from what's available or maybe something entirely new. So um, it is my hope there'll be some core KPIs that investors will be able to look at and that we can all gather and measure in the same way in a constantly, um, but there will always be new KPIs and new standards because what we want from ESG changes and expands over time. Okay, thanks Laura, that's fantastic. Thank you, it's really good insight. Um, Aaron, if I could just pass it to you just to finish, I know you talked- yeah, just briefly. Uh, yeah, briefly, yeah. go on, um, yeah, so, <laughs> just yeah, something. Just briefly on this, um, I, I, think, I think if you're an asset allocator, 
I think I think I'm second guessing. I'm just using experience of what we see. What we see is they want to see that you're a good investor. <laughs> yeah, first, um, and and hopefully you have a fully integrated ESG strategy. I'm not too sure whether funds really get capital because they're just ESG focused. Yeah, I, I maybe look, maybe they do, but I think that's around the edges. I think I think being a good investor is the preeminent um, decision or one criteria for decision making when when people are allocating capital. If you don't have an ESG strategy, then you're going to have to have a very good demonstrable track record to still get that capital. Um, and, and also maybe some kind of defense as to why you don't see it as key, key risk parameters, because I think we, we're all probably thinking that it is key to risk parameters now. Um, so I, I would answer it in that way, that there's no substitute for, um, you know, a, a strong and demonstrable track record. Um, and I think that's still preeminent. And then ESG should be absolutely key to uh creating and defending value in future that's the way of it great thank you aaron um so i think um it's been a great session really insightful um and engaging and i hope you know the audience would agree with that um i think just left to me just to say thank you very much uh, to laura brill from orchard street uh gabriele magotti from hig and aaron taggart from cheney uh, for their insights today and helping us uh understand the journey we're on i guess um so uh I just wanted to uh, shamefully plug uh, our next uh, instalment in the series, which will be um, on the 29th of June and will be on the race to net zero carbon uh, from a development and investment perspective. And I hope that we can welcome you all back uh, for that. Um, so thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Cheers. Okay.